If you would be wise, model your lives on the lives of the saints. If you would learn valor, follow Saint Nerevar the captain, patron of warriors and statesmen. If you would learn daring, follow Saint Veloth the pilgrim, patron of outcasts and spiritual seekers. When the triune named Almsivi entered the heart chamber in the bowels of Red Mountain, they did so as mortals. When they left the chamber, their return heralded by the incessant beat of the doom drum, they were demigods. They attuned themselves with the heart of Lorcan, thanks to Almalexia's courage, Sophocil's intellect, and Vivek's vision, the Kaima succeeded where the Dwemer had failed. Kagranak's tragic mistakes proved fatal to the entire race, but Almsivi were not dissuaded. They used the tools and survived. They used their newfound powers to become the preeminent leaders of Morrowind, and so the Tribunal Temple was born. It was always fitting for the Dunma to follow a religion devoted to the greatest of their own kin. The Tribunal were more god than mortal at this point, and their profane deeds within the Heart Chamber had led to the transformation of the Kaima into the Dunma. But whether their skin is gold or grey matters not, because the Elves of Morrowind revere their ancestors above any Aedra. Only the good Daedra, Azura, Boethia, and Mafala are venerated as staunchly as their ancestors. The Dunma believe that the spirits of their kin persist after death, and their acquired knowledge is not lost, even when their mortal bodies are cremated and have returned to the ash from whence they came. These spirits also protect their family shrines and precincts in the form of a ghost fence. The Dunma obviously adhere to the notion that time brings wisdom, even after death. The Dunma also do not see any significant distinction between the realms of Mundus, Oblivion, and Aetherius. They regard the mortal world and the other world as a whole with many paths from one end to the other, rather than two separate worlds of different natures with distinct borders. With both of these factors in mind, you can understand why the Dark Elves would be open to worshipping ascended members of their own race, whereas most other races place the Divines and accompanying Aedra above all else. The Tribunal Temple is headed by the triune of Almalexia, Sophocil, and Vivek. But beneath them, the temple saints are also worshipped as the most honoured ancestors of the Dunma, which is no small accolade considering the importance of ancestors to this race. These ancestors were formally canonised as saints by Almsivi for their exemplary deeds performed in life. Of these saints, there are greater and lesser saints. We know the greater saints well, and have talked about them extensively on the channel before. There's Inderil Nerevar, the legendary Hortator who led the United Kaima people in the Battle of Red Mountain. It was in this battle that Nerevar was killed, an event that is shrouded in scandal. It was also in the wake of this battle that Nerevar's wife, Armalexia, his teacher and advisor, Sophocil, and his counsellor, Vivek, would become the god kings of Morrowind. Inderil Nerevar was immortalised as the patron saint of warriors and statesmen, and House Redoran. The other is Saint Veloth, the prophet and pilgrim responsible for leading the Kaima from Somerset to Resdane, facilitating their transformation from Aldmer to Kaima, the Changed Ones. He is remembered as the patron saint of outcasts, seekers of spiritual knowledge, and of House Hlalu. There are three other greater saints, though they would be less pleased with the honorific. They are Almalexia, Sophocil, and Vivek. After the Tribunes disappeared, and following the devastation of the Red Year, the Tribunal Temple inevitably fell, and gave way to the rise of the New Temple. Almsivi were no longer seen as the God Kings of the Dunma, and were relegated to the status of Saint, a move that was no doubt made to appease those priests who were still devoted to the Tribunal. Like the other greater saints, we have talked about these figures in great detail, and we'll leave links in the description if you'd like to hear more about any of these five saints. But what about the lesser saints? These influential ancestors are easily overlooked, and not as much information on them exists compared to the greater saints. But in this video, we're going to tell their stories. Hey guys, it's Drew here, and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. Lucky for me, this topic has given me the perfect excuse to get lost in the gloriously outlandish province of Morrowind once again. No Tamrielic race compares to the Dunma when it comes to unique lore, from the wildlife and landscape, to the culture, customs, and beliefs of the people. So let's explore some of Morrowind Morrowind's most renowned individuals. Since it isn't explicitly stated when the Tribunal formally recognised each of the Saints, we'll list them alphabetically, so as not to understate any of their achievements. Our first Saint is named Aralor the Penitent. Aralor's origins are unlikely, as he was once a condemned criminal. In repentance for his sins, he travelled a circuit of the Great Pilgrimages on his knees. He also wore a shirt of hair, which would have served as a constant reminder of his 
sins. To live with the discomfort of the shirt was a physical manifestation of reconciling his past crimes. The shirt actually has the profoundly redundant effect of simultaneously damaging and healing the wearer. Aralor is the patron saint of tanners and miners, both humble professions, and it is said that one should look no further than Saint Aralor if they wish to learn self-respect and respect for others. Aralor serves as eternal proof that even the lowest in Dunmer society can still strive for rehabilitation and even greatness. And while his story may seem atypical, it is not unheard of in our world either, as forgiveness for your sins is a common motif in the Christian faith. I remember a parable I was told in school about a sheep thief who was branded with the letters ST on his forehead. He repented for his youthful sins and spent the rest of his life being a kind and helpful man to his neighbours. A stranger noticed the scars on the old man's head and asked another neighbour what the letters ST meant. The neighbour couldn't recall exactly, as the branding had obviously happened so long ago, but he thought he knew and said, it stands for saint. But anyway, year four religion class dismissed, back to the Elder Scrolls. Our next saint is named Delin the Wise. He is the patron saint of potters and glassmakers, and made his name as the former leader of House Inderil. He was a skilled lawyer, and authored numerous treatises on tribunal law and custom. If one wishes to learn benevolence, they are encouraged to seek out a shrine to Saint Delin the Wise. So Delin was more than just a capable and intelligent house leader, but was also well loved for his compassion. There's a story of a Dunmeri adventurer named Baronat, who claims to have communed with some of the saints in his quest to rescue a kidnapped lady. One of these saints was Delin, who watched the young adventurer from a cloud in the sky and smiled on him, before giving him some sage advice. Baronat, before you fight, find out what you're fighting for. Delin was honoured with a statue in Vivek City, as well as a canton in his name. Next comes Saint Felms the Bold. Felms is the patron of butchers and fishmongers, and his association with dead animals is fitting, as Felms the Bold was a prolific warlord, known for his ferocity. He was the bane of humans, and slew Nords in droves. His inability to read and write wouldn't have helped dispel the perception that he was a savage warrior, but Felms did not need to be literate to follow the orders given to him directly from the lips of Alm Sivi. He drove the Northmen from Morrowind, and if you wish to learn the arts of fierce justice, you should kneel before for his shrine. His mighty axe, named the Cleaver of St. Felms, fell into the hands of the Nerevarine as a gift for his many services to the Tribunal Temple. While it proved to somewhat tarnish the legacy of this warrior, it was also a great compliment that Sofasil wished to immortalise St. Felms in his clockwork city. Moments prior to Felms' death, Set placed the saint's soul in a modified black soul gem, which was then placed in a humanoid construct called a factotum. Felms' factotum was giant, and a testament to the craftsmanship of Sofa Seal's creations. Alas, it mattered not how magnificent his shell was, as the unnatural preservation of his soul in a largely meaningless mechanical existence took its toll on Felms, and he was driven to madness. An asylum caretaker in the brass fortress of the clockwork city named Landrus documented his descent. Saint Felms is in near constant motion, a sign that his continuing restlessness is at an all-time high. He resembles a trapped Kaguti pacing its cage, but with no bars to restrain him, I can only wonder how long his violent desires can be held in check. Truth be told, I am not sure the Order could construct a cage capable of confining the Saint's powers. My attempts to persuade Felms to relinquish his war axes have been fruitless. The mere suggestion that a warrior should surrender anything as much a part of himself as his weapons was enough to elicit a fiery contempt from him, though that may be regarded as an improvement. His reaction of disdain was measured and reasoned, compared to other outbursts of frustration and anger. While his moods are fleeting, there are signs that Felms is still capable of rationality. Not entirely comforting, given his almost singular focus on martial affairs and conquest. This was not the first time Sofa Seal was willing to profane his race's beliefs, and meddle with preternatural powers in the pursuit of knowledge. He had previously defied Nerevar's dying wish that they should not use Kagranak's tools on the heart of Lorcan, but we all know how that story ended. Eventually Saint Felms' soul was finally given peace, and his dying words were, a warrior earns his rest.
The next of the lesser saints is one you probably recognize. He was the last of the saints to be honored with the title by Vivek, just prior to the last remaining tribunal member's disappearance. His name is Saint Jib the Eradicator, though Jib himself likes the title Jib the Magnificent. Being such a recent addition to the Temple Saints, we actually know a lot about his life and his impact on Morrowind. He was the first to greet the Nerevarine on the prison vessel docking at Sedanine, and in less favorable circumstances, met the last dragonborn in the Soul Cairn. Jib's life, like Aralor the Penitents, began poorly. He was addicted to Skooma, and this addiction led him down a dark path, becoming an assassin to pay for his expensive habits. He was hired to take out a high-ranking Redoran official, only he was beaten to the punch by a member of the Morag Tong. Jib arrived at the crime scene to assassinate a target who was already dead, and the guards were already there. Jib was arrested and tried for murder. He was imprisoned in Vivek City, as well as the Imperial City, before returning to Morrowind with the Nerevarine and being set free. Unsurprisingly, Jib's skooma addiction had not been accommodated behind bars, and by the time he walked free from the port of Sedanine, he was a changed Mur, without the crippling vice that had thrust him into a life of crime to begin with. He yearned to redeem himself, and racked his brain for a way he could give back to the people. Exactly how he came up with his new purpose isn't explicitly documented, but I imagine he was wandering the countryside, pondering his options, when he was distracted by the rasping clamor of a cliff racer overhead, moments before the thing swooped and attacked him. That's when Jib realized his destiny to become Jib the Eradicator of the Winged Menace. In his own unctuous autobiography, Jib details his heroic rise to sainthood. I am a hunter, I am a redeemer, I am Jib. The tale of my rise to glory begins in the ash wastes of Morrowind. I rode alone, weapon at my side and the burning wind stinging my face. My quest was arduous, but necessary to ensure the survival of the Dunmer people. A pestilence was creeping across the Ashlands, a menace with an insatiable hunger, the plagued innocent travellers simply trying to get home. It was my self-sworn task to hunt them down, one by one, and drive them from the skies. Their fury knew no bounds, and their war cry resonated across the land. They were the notorious cliff racers, and they had to be destroyed. He then details his climactic battle against the 76 cliff racers. He survived the scrap, and had succeeded in completely ridding Vardenfell of cliff racers. Jib awoke before Vivek, who canonized him as a saint of the temple. The rest of Jib's existence was not so triumphant. He moved to Kavach, and was soul trapped by Dramora during the Oblivion Crisis. He now lives a solitary life, in the cold dark expanses of the Soul Cairn, his ancestral spirit serving no purpose to the people of Morrowind. At least, with the help of the Dragonborn, he was able to have his opus return to Tamriel, so that his legacy would live on. If you wish to learn reverence, follow Saint Lophis the Pious, patron of tailors, dyers and house dress. Saint Lophis was a religious leader in the Tribunal Temple, and was well loved by Arm Sivi. He formulated the central rituals and principles of the New Temple faith, bringing the traditional and familiar rites of the Dunma into the future under the Tribunal. Saint Lophis is the symbolic mortal bridge between the gods and the faithful, and the archetypical priest. Lophis was given the same treatment as Felms by Sofa Sil. On Lophis's deathbed, the wizard god Set transferred his soul to a specially crafted factotum, and just like Felms, the unholy conservation of his soul led to mental deterioration. Sofa Sil's willingness to defy the sacred passage of a mortal soul to the afterlife seems even more profane when considering that Lophis was a priest and a pious myrrh, and he surely would have held reservations about his soul living on inside an artificial construct. Once again, caretaker Landras documented Lophis's decline in mental faculty. Saint Lophis's withdrawal from reality, so much as that word has meaning here, continues unabated down a path of despondent reclusion. In many cases he fails to acknowledge or recognize attempts to communicate. I believe that this behavior is not so much a form of catatonia as the manifestation of a crippling depression, a diagnosis supported by undirected utterances made by Lophis during brief periods of activity. These episodes have become more frequent and increasingly distraught. It appears that he is lamenting the loss of a deep spiritual connection. After being freed from his metal shell, Lothis says, This was not an extension of my existence, but a transformation. I can see that now. His spirit was eventually imbued within the divine relic, called the Crozier of St. Lothis. 
Our next saint showed signs of greatness ever since she was a little girl. She showed a remarkable gift for healing that was unthinkable for such a young child. She was promptly trained as a healer and learned an even more special gift that transcended any formal medical training, the ability to save the lives of soldiers by inspiring them to seek peace instead of bloodshed. If you hope to learn the love of peace on your pilgrimage across Morrowind, visit a shrine to St. Meris the Peacemaker, patron of farmers and labourers. Meris's most famous feat was ending a long and bloody house war, intervening on the battlefield in her white robe to heal warriors and spellcrafters without regard to faction. The troops of all houses adopted white robes as her standard and refused to shed the blood of their brethren. When ordinator initiates, the holy guards and cleric soldiers of the tribunal temple don their cuirasses for the first time they do so while reciting a prayer to the peacemaker. Next, we have St. Ohms the Just, the patron of Chandlers, Clerks, and House Inderil. If you seek to learn the rule of law, follow St. Ohms. Ohms was the saint responsible for founding the Ordinators. He conceived and articulated the fundamental principles of testing, ordeal, and repentance, values that have long been appreciated by the Dunma since the foundational teaching of Boethia. Mortality is a test, an obstacle to overcome. Like Delin, Ohms has a canton in Vivek City named in his honour. Ohms was another of the saints who appeared to Baranat in his adventures. St. Ohms the Just appeared before Baranat in a burst of flame and smiled on him. Baranat, I will make you more cunning in battle than the most dangerous of Daedra. Ohms was the third and final saint to have his soul transported into a factotum by Sophocil. His mechanical vessel was the greatest of the three. He was given the body of a clockwork titan, complete with brass wings that miraculously allowed his hulking form to take flight. And as you've probably surmised, not even a superior factotum would save Ohms' sanity. Asylum caretaker Landras had this to say about Ohms' condition. Saint Ohms continues to chafe under his confinement. Despite my best attempts to deter him, Ohms has begun to seek comfort in the sky, but we both know his flights outside the atrium are only the illusion of freedom. The bonds that are dragging his mind into the pit of insanity are not the walls of the asylum sanctorium. That artificial body is both his cell and the weight chained to his ankles. He cannot adapt to the new life Lord Set has granted him. None of the saints can, but Ohms in particular feels tormented in his existence. He truly believes that he's being tested or punished, and this persecution complex grows more intense with every moment he's forced to endure his suffering. When freed from his factotum, Ohm says, order is restored. One of the lesser known saints is named Rilms the Barefooted. She is the patron of pilgrims and beggars, and her lack of a grandiose title is fitting, for she would likely give it away if she had a better one. St. Rilms gave away her shoes and began dressing in rags to better acquaint herself with the poor. If you consider generosity a virtue worth striving for, look no further than St. Rilms. And that is all we know about her. During her life, thousands of Dunmer would have walked past her, mistaking her for a destitute vagabond. Her shoes are sacred artifacts in Morrowind. Of all the saints, it is Roris who best represents the importance of racial and tribal pride to the Dunmer. His title is Saint Roris the Martyr, and in the build-up to the brutal Arnesian War of Third Era 396 between the Dark Elves and the Argonians, Roris was a prisoner of the Lizard Folk. The Argonian sorcerers tortured him relentlessly, compelling him to renounce the Tribunal Temple, but Roris refused and held firm to his beliefs. He was killed for his stubbornness, becoming a martyr, but his fellow Dunmer saw this as the ultimate display of devotion and loyalty. Many Dark Elves who lived to see this bloody war would tell you that Roris' sacrifice was crucial in rallying the forces of Morrowind. They were driven on by a thirst for vengeance, and the need to ensure his martyrdom was not in vain. Roris was canonised posthumously. He is the patron saint of furnishers and caravanners, and was the third of the lesser saints to appear to Baranat. St. Roris the Martyr appeared before Baranat, with flesh like sparkling gems, and smiled on him. Baronet, I will make you unyielding as the heart of oblivion. If you would learn mercy and its fruits, follow Saint Seren the Merciful, patron of brewers, bakers, and distillers. Seren was a pure virgin who never sinned. She remained unsullied so that she could take on the sins and impurities of others. She could heal all diseases at the price of taking the disease upon herself. Modesty may have been her most esteemed virtue, but there is no questioning the courage and strength of will Seren would have certainly possessed to take on the burdens of so many 
others. She carried these burdens gracefully into her old age. There is only one other lesser saint, but his name has only ever been mentioned once in Dunmary records, suggesting he was not the most popular and beloved of the saints. His name is Voris the Immolent, and his only documented patronage is over House Telvani. This information comes from the mottos of the Dunmary Great Houses, and unless I'm missing something, Immolent isn't even a word, so I can't tell you anything about him based on that. It could be a mistake, and he's actually Voris the Immolate, or Immolated, which would suggest that the Telvani burned him alive as a sacrifice of some kind, but that seems unlikely. If I'm missing something here, feel free to berate me about it in the comments. The only other thing to add about Voris comes from a Reddit AMA, in which the former lawmaster, Lawrence Schick, says that the saint was unsavory, and reverence for him fell out of fashion. But that's Voris the Immolent for you, I save the worst for last. And on that rather anticlimactic note, we've covered all of Morrowind's lesser saints. I hope you enjoyed the video, thanks so much for watching, I've been Drew, this has been Fudge Muppet, and I'll see you in the next one.